The next chapter with Prim Saripapad is a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, everybody, it's Prim. Welcome to the next chapter presented by Baron Davis and Slick Studios. This week's guest is former Major League Baseball player, current broadcaster and baseball analyst for ESPN and also Marquee Sports Network. Also a writer, an author, a motivational speaker and a professor, Doug Glanville. During his nine major league seasons, Doug became known for his exceptional defense as an outfielder. He played for the Philadelphia Phillies, Chicago Cubs, and also Texas Rangers. And as a first round draft pick in 1991, and the first African-American Ivy League graduate to play in the MLB coming out of Penn, there were a lot of scouts and clubs that questioned his commitment to baseball because of his strong academic background. And it's mind boggling to think that student athletes still might be getting these types of questions from professional teams and scouts. But Doug showed that one could be a phenomenal student with all these interests beyond sport coming out of an Ivy League school and still be able to cut it in professional baseball and still be able to focus on their craft. In this interview, I wanted to learn more about Doug as a person. And I was curious about what factors, including his familial upbringing, shaped how he uses sport as a vehicle to explore and address important societal issues. You know, he's always had this way with words and whether they are spoken or written, I wondered, where did it come from? And where did his poetic eloquence stem from? If you've read or seen any one of his pieces on ESPN or the New York Times or the Atlantic, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. It is an enlightening conversation about how one's journey can be shaped by their environment, familial and also geographically, and also how the game of baseball can help us navigate the complexities of life because there's so many lessons to be learned from sport and from baseball. I really hope you enjoy this conversation and learn something from it the way I did. So without further ado, here's Doug Glanville. It's, it's so wonderful to have you on. As always, it's wonderful to see you. You know, you and I have had the opportunity to work together bits and pieces here and there, not only at ESPN, I got to come on your show, classes in session, which I absolutely love. It's such an amazing concept. But, you know, I'm, I'm really just excited to hear more about not just your, your journey through and around baseball, but beyond it as well. You know, I think that I've gotten the chance to to listen to a number of interviews with you and so much of it centers around your athletic journey. But I, I, I'm curious about, um, to know more about you as a person, a journalist, a broadcaster, a creator, um, a father, a husband. Um, so I, I'm just really excited to have you on. Welcome. Yeah. Prim, it's great to be here. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, it was, you know, always a pleasure of working with you. I know we always talked about, you know, the sort of all these, as you said, the next chapter, right? What, what, you know, where are we going? And, and there's times, even when you're doing what you're doing, you're not really sure exactly, you know, where it's taking you. So I've always thought deeply about transition, uh, the next chapter, because as a ball player, you know, you know, it's going to end, right? Is this over, right? You're, you're an athlete, you, you had your tennis career and, you know, it's um, something that confronts you at times when you feel either unprepared or certainly it's not often on your own schedule. So, um, so I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just glad to be able to do what I'm doing now uh, as I'm sort of continuing the journey post-career and uh, so far so good. I've enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I mean, you're you're doing a lot. You you really are. You're juggling so many different hats, which is really cool and and speaks to the well-rounded nature of you, um, which we'll get into today. And you know, the show is about I, I, for for whatever reason, I'm just so fascinated with transitions. They're just critical, pivotal moments that I feel like can really oftentimes like define somebody and and also their journey. 
And I find it, um, you know, I find it interesting about our experience at ESPN, but another experience that we share with one another is, is the 2017 experience of both of us having been laid off from ESPN. But of course, you've returned, not surprising, back to ESPN in um, 2019. But just out of curiosity, you know, we we haven't really gotten a chance to to dive into that and and really talk about it. We have exchanged messages over the years, but how how do you process obstacles and challenges like that? Yeah, well, you know, there's no doubt that um, you know, there's an element of being blindsided, right? You you kind of <laughs> chart things out, and, you, and I think for me. The the interesting thing I often tell people is like I'm not I'm not really a goal setter, um, and I and I've had to learn to be more of it because as a parent, it, it was, I didn't feel like I was giving them the best tools to be like well no you figure it out just trust your internal compass you know things like that, so I realized that I had to find a way to not only learn how to teach it but to employ it more in my life to think about you know, what's, what could be next and what I'm actually striving for and not just personally, but as a family or as a community or something larger than self. And, uh, and it wasn't a natural state for me to say, okay, here's where I'm going. But I do know that, you know, when I was playing professional baseball, it was very clear that it was finite. There's no doubt about it now. Uh, and I also understood that, although the metrics sometimes of success may say, Hey, you, you're in the hall of fame. You had a great career. You made all this money. It's over, right? That's it. You know, you've done everything you need to do. And then you look up and you're 35 or 34 and you did have a full career, but it's like, wait a minute, you know, what's next. And Mm -hmm. what I tapped off in was how sports inform life itself. You know, thinking about forks in the road and you come to these different forks And you think that's it. You say, well, all right, I just want to get to the big leagues. And then you're like in the big leagues. Like, no, 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 I just want to be a starter. And then you're like, no, 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 I want to be an all-star. And you realize like there is a human aspect of this that you're always striving in a certain way and time, nothing really sits still. And that, that sort of competitive spirit as an athlete wanted me to feel like I was moving forward or at least moving at all. And, and I realized that, you know, stasis or stagnation was sort of a, you know, I saw it almost a little bit like an enemy, right? You're like, all right, if I'm not growing and learning and developing and being open-minded, especially like as a parent, as a husband, like where you're constantly dealing with dynamic changes, then I'm probably behind and, and things are going to sort of blow right by me. And so, you know, so I looked at those opportunities and and even the setbacks or the losses, like you mentioned, being laid off and all these things, although very painful and hard in the moment, I still had a, a belief that, okay, this is, a, this still is an opportunity. There is, you know, along all these roads, it wasn't just the supporters I was thanking. I was thanking detractors. I was thanking people that kind of made me figure out what ground I was standing on. And even if it wasn't out of the kindness of their heart, even if they wished my demise, let's say, I still felt that there was something to pull from it to, to gain and develop and, improve upon. And, you know, so I think that's helped me a lot in any of these moments where I was sort of caught off guard and I, you know, wasn't going as forward as I thought, and then had to reset. They definitely helped me. That helped me take those next steps. Yeah. The the concept of having an appreciation and accepting not just our supporters, but our detractors. And I've heard you kind of mention that before. And it seems like some of the, the appreciation for the detractors in, during our journey. It seems like some of that might have stemmed uh, during your time in the minor leagues, it sounds like, or did, did that begin even further back? I would say the, the minor leagues was definitely a clear professional example. But I think coming up, you know, I grew up in a town in North Jersey, Teaneck, New Jersey, and Teaneck's claim to fame was that it voluntarily, voluntarily desegregated in the early 60s. And, and I grew up in the 70s with a, watching a town that was really committed to diversity and inclusion, but not in sort of the buzzword, like checkbox way, but it was like a way of life. You know, they, they backed it up in every facet of our community. So whether I went to church or um, baseball teams, I, I saw diversity. I saw people working uh, on how to work together. And I, I love that about my town. And so, you know, so even when, I, when you have a town like that and experience like that, 
the outside world, there's a lot of examples that we're not a fan of yours, right? They're like, oh, you know, people, you know, checking boxes or they're just, you know, you just have whatever the latent racism, you have all these things that looked upon our experiment as something negative. And, uh, and certainly they may have had it been in communities that didn't have this type of diversity. So I realized that there is a lot of people along the way that might lay in the road, not just because of anything other than, you know, dynamics of identity or power, all these things that kind of play a role. And that, that was, so those were my early examples of like, Oh, wow. But why did that happen? And, you know, I mean, I tell, wrote a story in one of my New York times articles about my experience uh, in Boston playing against the Red Sox. And I, I wrote about, I've written, mentioned this a couple of times, but I was walking home from school and this is the town I'm just praising about its diversity and inclusion. And I was probably in fourth grade maybe. And a grown man sitting on his porch, like flips a switchblade as I'm walking by, throws the N word at me and is like daring me to come to him. So I'm sitting there going, okay, all right. Now, now the tractor is an understatement in this situation, mm -hmm. but it was a moment where I had to ask myself, even at that age, like, okay, you know, am I going to allow him to define me, you know, as, as what he deems as, you know, some racial epithet or is it, do I, am I more than that? And I kind of, after having an experience of validation in my community where people supported our diversity, he just seemed like someone like, no, you actually have the problem. And I could kind of look at that as a 10 year old at the moment. And that's how I simplified it. So, so there was always these moments and nothing's more difficult to, to surpass and overcome when those hurdles are so are woven into your identity. I think yeah. those are, so it, it sort of dwarfed, some of the professional and other things that kind of came along the way, because that, that was, once you're able to kind of navigate that space, these other spaces become much simpler. Wow. Yeah. I think, so the, the experience with detractors really, it sounds like began from way before your experience in minor leagues. I know there's, you tell that story of, of your experience and relationship with Ron Clark, the manager. And, but it sounds like it started from day one as a young boy growing up in New Jersey, which by the way, T-neck, I know you were born in Hackensack, right? Which is not too far from where we live here in Jersey. Yeah. Well, Hackensack's a rival. So anytime I saw on the scoreboard, <laughs> on the road, like born Hackensack, New Jersey. I wanted to like throw a rock at the scoreboard. <laughs> okay. Like Teaneck Hackensack rivalry, but I was actually born in Hackensack. Okay. And, okay. Uh, but yeah, grew up in Teaneck. Uh, they, they pretty okay. much drove over the river. And uh, so, uh, but yeah, it's, it, um, I love that about my town. And I think, as you mentioned in baseball, you know, my AAA manager, that was a nightmare. It was a nightmare because we were like oil and water and uh, got to the point where, bordering on physical altercation after what was like a year and a half of just what I deemed as like abuse, you know? And, and, um, I think, yeah, even though I had these other experiences, that was hard, but I also remember that it's very easy to hyper-focus on the person that's sort of making your life miserable as you see it and miss all the people that are kind of whispering in her ears, sometimes standing up for you and saying, no, we think you're going to be this. We know we disagree. Uh, I think that is important to elevate as well because the loud drum can often be the negativity, right? The drum saying, you know, this, you know, they're ca causing all this havoc and you're forgetting that there's all these people around you that are, are contrary to this person, the spirit of this person. And, um, and so, and then, you know, sometimes with the luxury of time, I'm able to say, okay, I had to go through these experiences. And what I was able to pull from it is a certain strength because I, and I never forgot the end of the, uh, the next year. So I got called up after a year and a half of like kind of borderline hell under <laughs> this guy. And I get to the big leagues and I remember we were like in Philadelphia or somewhere and the scouting report was, they were trying to figure out like who was Glanville amongst all these young Cubs guys coming up. And I remember one of the descriptions the person had had parroted off of my kind of report from this manager was that I wasn't tough enough. I wasn't tough or whatever it was, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember being able to say, you know, have the wherewithal to say, well, this, this is kind of about the power you give people. And in the end, like he could declare me tough or not tough. 
But what does he really know? Because you'll never find out until the smoke clears and the smoke is not cleared yet. So I, cause for all we know, I could be the only one standing at the end. Right. So, and I think that once you kind of are able to realize to put someone in a certain box that they're in, or, or maybe in a certain time in your life and you realize like, well, how much power am I going to give this guy to just be like, Oh, you're right. Like I'm not really tough. And now, you know, or can you find a way to be motivated by it? And, and still that that's an asset, you know, it might've been something you deem negative or may have, you know, been attempted to be negative, but then you found a way to, to turn it. And, and I also felt a certain privilege of being able to tap the, like you mentioned, like doing all these different things. It helped a lot to see the world beyond baseball, right? It helped mm -hmm. to know that this wasn't just it. And that there was other things out there. And I know that there's a luxury in that. If you, you know, I had a chance to go to an Ivy League school and do all these things and engineering. So I knew that, that there is another path somewhere out there. And, uh, and I, so when you're not boxed into this corner and this one person has all this power, it takes you away from those desperate measures and, and desperate measures, anything from taking PEDs to, you know, because when you start, when you only see something in one, you know, one possibility that there's one tr track, then yeah, you're going to run over everything because there's, you don't see any other way around it, including yourself. Yeah. And, and I found that that, that helped me a lot. Wow. Yeah. That, that's so fascinating. And you're, you're absolutely right that, um, and I do feel as though athletes get boxed in and our society puts them in those boxes and they only see sport and oftentimes it, that hyper-focused way as the way out or the way towards success. And as you, you've been describing yourself and your journey, I don't know why. And I want you to uh, let me know if these adjectives um, feel like they, if you feel like they describe you, but the word poetic comes to mind and also fluid. Like when I think about you and your journey and what you do, you are oftentimes so poetic. There's something about your voice and your word, whether it's spoken or written, you write, you broadcast your, your analysis of baseball, but the way you also integrate uh, sport with the, the so, uh, many social and racial issues. And then also fluid. I almost kind of see you as like, it's like water. And, and anything that kind of comes up, these holes or these opportunities, you do it so quietly and it's almost as you find another way to go through. Is that, is that an inaccurate description? Let me know if, if that's totally off. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's, uh, no, I think it's very descriptive and accurate. I mean, I, uh, I can't say I sort of had a premeditated approach to like the fluidity, but I do think that my hometown started that journey. And, and my parents, you know, my dad was from Trinidad and Tobago. My mom was from North Carolina and, and Rocky Mountain area. And they settled in New Jersey and they committed. They really chose my hometown because of its commitment to, to as I, I think it was considered one of the demo, most democratic towns in America at one point by the, the military. And I think my parents had saw, seen a poll. They had some friends settle in the area. So I think that taking that step, and realizing that, okay, we're all human. We're trying to work through this. There was a fluidity to trying to understand each other and without a timeline necessarily like, okay, here we go. Let's try to, we're navigating all this, this world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it speaks to also my dad, I'd say was the one that disar disarmed a room. He was very calm. You know, he had his Trinidadian accent. He kind of flowed. He was a psychiatrist. So he had this sort of deeper thought on things. And I learned a lot by watching how he just sort of was able to flow through things and, um, and not get derailed or, or discouraged or, you know, because he, he certainly had to start over when he came to a whole new country at 31 years mm -hmm. old. And he was already established. Mm -hmm. He was already established in Trinidad as a teacher and uh, had to start over and ended up going through med school at Howard University. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I certainly watched and my mom was our kind of civil rights activist, really conscious of taking the spirit of what Teaneck was becoming to make it something broader, a worldview. And, and I saw her work on the ground often to try to make, you know, uh, grounds and headway on people learning how to communicate. So I, I think, so, you know, I would say the fluidity comes from living in these kinds of environments and maybe even playing baseball, a sport that speaks to me so well, because you have to be, 
you, you don't start at the top. You know, you, you get drafted and I don't care how good you are. You have to go to the minors and, and there's no, it's very nonlinear in certain ways, even though it's kind of a pyramid. Um, you know, so I think that that actually helped me over time realize like, okay, well you want to go to double a or triple a and the next level, but all oh, it's, it is circuitous to get to these places. Mm. Um, you know, and, and so, and, and then speaking to poetry, my dad often wrote poems. Uh, that was his, I'd say that was his relaxation. He would, I remember us going to the Birmingham uh, Civil Rights, in, I think they call it Institute, but museum. And we, all of a sudden I was, you know, it's real intense. You know, you go in and all of a sudden my dad's off writing a poem in the corner. He's like inspired wow. and he would just write. And he, he self-published a couple of books. And so I, you know, I think that my dad, who passed away probably about 20 years ago now, I think you know, later I came to understand fully the weight and the importance of how he communicated to him. And I think for me, mm. the best way I've found him sort of alive in my life has been through writing. I think that actually, you know, I've had pictures and videos and all these things that we try to do to remember, but I found the, the really most direct connection to him has been through writing. And I think when I wrote my first New York Times piece, and I saw all the reciprocation and the therapeutic you know, sort of experience I had. I said, oh, I get it now. I really understand now why this poetry was so important. And um, so a lot of it is tapping him and on the poetic side. And I think the, the fluidity is kind of a, maybe a little bit my mom in that sense too, but also my, my dad, his long journey and getting to where he was. I had no idea about your your that relationship with your father. Um, I knew that he was a psychiatrist, but I had no idea that he actually wrote a lot of poetry. And I mean, my goodness, it really comes out in your writing. Your writing is exceptional and you seem to really gravitate towards it. It even comes out in in your broadcasting work, maybe less about the the color analyst and when you're talking about baseball, but even when you do talk about baseball, there is a poetry um, an eloquence about, about your words and your approach that I don't really hear too much on, on our airwaves. And so that is really interesting, uh, um, just to hear about your familial upbringing and the parental influence, because it, it does, right? Our childhoods so much, whether it's our geographical location, our environment, culture, our mother, our fathers, just one, um, it really shapes who we, who we become. And so I think my question now is having a little bit more backdrop about your, your parents and, and also hearing your, your father also being a, a teacher prior to his journey as being a psychiatrist. And now that gives me maybe a little bit more understanding about how you got into pedagogy yourself and teaching, but where did baseball come into play? How were you drawn to that? Hmm. And I, I have to give my brother a lot of credit for baseball. Now, my dad, being from Trinidad, learned to play cricket, so he had you know the sort of the bones of baseball in his in his uh, in his life. <laughs> Different sports. So I think when he came to the United States, and my, my brother was born in 1962, uh, he loved baseball, and so the combination of my brother kind of being my first coach, I think that really was the spark. And, and I always wanted to be my brother or chase my brother. I was always, my motivation or my competitiveness came from chasing him, who was, of course, and it was in everything. I mean, I wanted to learn the same math as he did. And, you know, we're, we're almost eight years apart. So, um, so I think that was the, really where baseball, he showed me. And I remember he had a, um, like a scorebook at one point and he wrote on there kind of his plan and and his plan really was what he wanted me to do. And, and I think he had like wiffle ball and stick ball and stratomatic baseball. And, and he mapped out like playing, you know, street baseball with like our neighbors. And he had a very specific, but in the end it was wow. major league. Like his goal was for me to get there. And uh, so I think early on he taught me when you play stratomatic in these games and you're like five or six years old, you learn how to make lineups and you learn how to you know, look at the stats and decide who to hit against a lefty. And I love the numbers. And so my mom, my mom is a math teacher. So, so it was a very good combination mm -hmm. of like cricket, Trinidad, baseball, math, and just like chasing my big brother. So baseball was a very easy and early fit for me. I think it's, uh, you know, I always tell my kids, like, oh, if one day you really want to understand your dad, just learn baseball. It's, a, it's, a, it's the easiest, shortest cut <laughs> to get there. And uh, then we can go from there. But um, yeah, so baseball was always in my life as long as I can remember. Oh, my goodness. So you're, for somebody who is not 
goal oriented. And yet you were being exposed to that goal oriented nature because your older brother was literally sitting there mapping out your entire <laughs> athletic trajectory, basically. He's like, okay, we're going to start here with second ball. And then it's eventually going to end in major league baseball. Yeah. And I, and I didn't, I followed him. That's all that I thought about. I didn't look at like, Oh, I got to be here at this year. I was just like, where's he going? And then what was so hard is I actually, the first thing I ever did before him was retire from baseball. Like I, you know, I was like, like he, he played piano and then he got tired. And then it's like, I, I eventually like anything he did, I tried to hang in there. And then, so I was a little bit lost. Like, I'm about to retire from baseball and my brother, you know, my brother who's, you know, eight years older is still playing out there. So I, I think that was a, that was a big step for baby brother to go out there and make this decision for his own life. And, and uh, I met my wife and I know that that was a big, a big part of like, okay, it's time. So, uh, but yeah, that was, that's how much of a guidepost he was in my life and uh, how much I, uh, baseball was always connected to brotherhood. Like we, we used to come mm-hmm. home from our different games in full uniform, all dirty and be like, and just go through play by play. And this is what happened here. are The highlights, we would do that. Like every, every night we'd come in and just talk about the games. And to this day, we still like, I'm sending them text messages and stuff. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's been, you know, you always hear about fathers and sons and all these sort Mm -hmm. of stories about parenting parents with their kids. But really for me, it was brotherhood. Baseball was a brotherhood for me. And I think it allowed me to, to be, uh, to fit in really well as a teammate. Mm, mm-hmm. and, and that's really interesting that you had that, that level of connection with your brother, because sometimes when there's that big of an age gap, there can be just as close of a connection, but it's different because of that age gap. And, you know, I've talked to other athletes and sometimes they, while they are close with their sibling, but it can also feel like a parental relationship. And especially if there's almost a decade between you, but it sounds like, um, you were, you both were close, but did, did he also take on just kind of like a, uh, maybe not a father figure role, but another parental figure role? I would say more of a coach. I think more of a mm. coach. I think, um, you know, we, um, you know, so we would share and, and he'd have, you know, okay, let's, let's take batting practice at the, you know, park down the street. So, um, and I think it would help too. My brother always was youthful you know, he had a, a kid like nature to him. That was so great for a big brother for me, you know, just being able to still want to play these games with me, even when he was probably like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm too old for this. I'm bored or whatever. He, he was loved it. He just loved going out there and, uh, and show us the game. So I think that that was, um, what we, you know, shared throughout our whole life. And in some ways, my dad, my dad had me in his like mid forties and he started having some health issues. So in some ways I needed my brother to be able to be just to physically keep up with me out there throwing batting practice where my dad was a little more compromised over time. And, And so that was another thing that he it wasn't necessarily the fatherhood side, but he filled a certain void of just like showing up mm-hmm. and the, the commitment that it takes in any sport, right? To practice and be out there. I I never really saw it as much like work, right? I was like, oh, this is this is just fun. I was always uh, looking a way to play. And if I wasn't playing baseball, I was playing wiffle ball or stratomatic or something. <laughs> so even in the winter, I was doing something. So yeah, it was, uh, but he, he, lit, he lit the way for sure. And and, um, you know, it's why even once again to this day, the, a lot of our conversations are around sports, but baseball in particular. That's awesome. That's really great. Uh, how old were you when your father started having some health issues? Well, I, I always remember growing up that he had a special chair that was like, was like traction. He always had these neck problems. So he'd sit in the chair and it would, it's like weighted, like pulley system, and he would kind of stretch his neck. And I knew, so he had a lot of stuff going on with nerves and, but, you know, he just didn't say a lot, didn't complain, you know, just sort of did the routine. He walked a lot to stay in shape. Uh, but I think the, the, some of the bigger health issues, uh, I, well, one that, you know, I've really noticed and, and shocked everybody was he, he had a heart attack just as I was about to graduate from Penn. Uh, I was, mm-hmm. I had taken the semester spring off to play went back in the fall and I was pr- about to present my final. I'd already taken all my finals and it was my final senior design paper for engineering. And he had a heart attack in, uh, in New Jersey. And I remember it took a while for my mom to track me down like 24 hours. So by the time I went up there, I, you know, rescheduled my final, 
I, uh, he was like in the hospital. And I, so I, I remember coming in and being shocked because he was in wires and beeping sounds. And I was like horrified, mm. but my mom had seen him on the edge and come back to that. So for her and everybody who had shown up that day, when it first happened, they were relieved. So it was a little bit of an emotional mismatch at the moment. Mm. And, uh, you know, but it, it, so it crystallized, you know, how, you know, the finite nature of our life. And, and my dad has just always been there. And I was 22, whatever it was, 23. Mm. And, uh, and so I think, you know, because of that moment, when I finally made the big leagues, which was, you know, five years later, four years later, uh, he said, whoa, you know, I almost missed this. You know, I remember that was like his thought, his first thought, uh, because it was, it was close. And, um, and though, and later he eventually by, you know, he's diabetic and all these things started to spiral. And by the time he was, the time I got to the big leagues, 2000, uh, I got in the big leagues in 96, but by the time I got more settled, uh, he started mm-hmm. really having cascading, you know, cancer and everything started to, to roll. So I lost him in 02 on the final game of the season, which mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, happened to be the day I got my 1000th hit of my career. So, um, but it was in some ways, maybe it was, that was the poetry of it, right? He passes away at the same time the game ends that I get my 1000th hit. It's the last game of the season. And, uh, and I remember my brother had like a similar moment when he was playing tennis in the, uh, of, afar. So we, always were very connected in that way. And, um, so I ended up burying, you know, when we had the service, the, the, the funeral was actually just beautiful people, the speakers, the day, the kids laughing in the, in the, uh, outside were in the playground and it was so perfect. And, um, I remember burying him with the ball, you know, putting the baseball for my 1000 hit in the casket, you know, that was sort of my final, you know, uh, gesture of, of gratitude and, and connection. And, uh, but I think in that moment, I knew that whatever was going forward was memories and, and spiritual in nature of how we'd be connected. So when you mentioned poetry, uh, that was, that was it. That was the, that was the through line. And, wow. uh, and so I tell people, you know, I remember speaking at Kelly writer house at Penn recently. And I, I remember telling the students is like, I know writing is like a craft or a discipline or I said, but for me, it's just, it's, it's like something really way deeper than that. It's like, it, it really is almost like, you know, how I connect with the world. It's like a flow for me, as you mentioned, of just, you know, and it's a spiritual connection to my, my father. And it's, so I write for, with such a different purpose, you know, it's not like, Oh, let me get this column in. It's, it's really like, it's therapeutic. It's, it's, um, you know, it's kind of world building, I'd say, because I, I like to write of, into the world I would love to see exist. You know, there's a, um, and that's also mm. like an engineering concept. It's the world as it is, huh. the world as it will be, and the world as it should be. And we used to design, we used to have to take the world and describe how it is. We used to have to project where it would go if we didn't make any changes. And then we used to have to say, how do we design it so that we can get to the world that I'd like to see? And that's the as it should be state. That's a systems engineering methodology. And so I think of writing like that, like, you know, hey, um, yeah, I want to write about this incident that happened to me when I was shoveling my driveway. But I also want to make sure I put in there what I hope for, you know, where I want this to go. And that to me is a lot of channeling my parents in a way, like in, in thanks for what they instilled in me and, and the world that they tried to share with me as a diverse community of TNAC that said, we're all people, we're all together. And sports is just a great microcosm of how we can learn how to be good teammates. I thought that was a beautiful example for the world. So I try to write even on really hard topics that I have to call stuff out in my own mind. And I have to, but at the same time, I, you know, George Floyd, yes, but I got to also say, oh yeah, but law enforcement were my teammates all through growing up in Teaneck. Mm. And the chief of police was my teammate in the summer to this day. And they were brothers of mine. And so I can't just blanket a group of people or a profession without recognizing I have other contexts and, and I have to, and to be fair to anything, I need to lean into both just like my manager in AAA. I can't, I can't like, I feel like I'm giving him too much power. If I say, this is all coaches, this is all this. When I'm looking behind me and my hitting coach is telling me, don't worry about it. You're going to be in the big leagues. Well, why am I ignoring him when he's actually there supporting me as, you know? So I found that that writing became, the perfect storm of all that. And, um, and so it's, uh, it's always, it's worked out always on a higher plane for me. 
wow, that is so, um, again, just like the poetic nature of not just how you operate, but how you live your life and how things seem to fall into place, almost like even more so than other people's journeys. But now I'm starting to understand maybe the um, why uh, engineering, and I had never heard engineering in my mind, engineering is just very mathematical science, just things that I'm horrible at, <laughs> but the aspirational nature of engineering and baseball and po and poetry that in some ways it's um it is a form of expression right is it not a sense of creativity but also like processing the world as it is but also as it could be and as that as it should be and it seems like that's also how you live your life and that makes me understand um why you were so good at baseball because i think i would be a horrible baseball player because in my mind i'm like Oh, I'm batting 300. Like, man, I must be doing awful, you know. And I've had this conversation about getting into entrepreneurship, and which is much of what I'm doing right now, and trying what I'm trying to do with my career in this show. And my husband is is such a cheerleader, and he helps me along the way because he does a lot of stuff in startups. And he's like, "You don't, you don't get it. Like, you have to get like eight no's, nine no's. That is normal. But even if you get three yeses." To you, that is failure. But in reality, like if you were a baseball player, you'd be going to the Hall of Fame. We literally just had this conversation. I'm like, I just can't get over it. But your aspirational, your positivity, your optimism. I mean, it makes so much sense about why those three pieces work well, why you were such a good baseball player. Yeah, baseball. I mean, and yeah, it's, it's, it's tough if you see things in just like that immediate, right? I mean, you have to be focused in the batter's box and try to win the battle, but you also have to have this perspective. Like I would say baseball is a series of tomorrows, right? You have to always know like, all right, there, there's always tomorrow and the next day and 162 of these things. Right. And, uh, and you know, and, and you have to have a long memory. It's like, Oh yeah, I faced that guy in 93 in double a. Now, sometimes that's why you hold grudges all the time forever, but there's other times where you're like, I remember he got me out with a slider and I, I'm going to, I'll be ready for it the next time, you know? And, and so it's a, it's always that cat and mouse because they're doing the same thing, right? They're adjusting to you. And, uh, and so that world made sense to me and, and the engineering, of course, I chose systems engineering because I didn't pick a specific, like, okay, mechanical or electrical, or mm. I, I didn't, I wasn't connected to those. And I wasn't, I didn't have a real good 3d mind and mechanical and chemical was kind of cool, but I was like, no, I don't want to blow anything up. So then I was like, <laughs> Systems made sense. You know, yeah. system was the integration of all these. So, for, you know, what I did, I ultimately studied transportation systems specifically. And the cool thing about it is like, all right, let's say I'm designing, you know, a subway platform in New York City. You have to think of everything as a systems engineer. You can't just be like, oh, here's a lab. And it says that it's this height and that's it. You have to interview you know, people about their psychology, like, do they want more space? Do they want a yellow line to stand behind? Do they mm. want a vending machine? Do you want, you have to look at the economics of the community. How much can you spend on it? You have to study the science of the materials you're using and, and the elevation, like all that was system. We were the ones that integrated all these parts into an optimal system. That's what I loved about it. And so when, you know, it's, it's an ability to see all the pieces and actually elevate all the pieces and understanding the value of all of them, that they all are significant. And, uh, and I felt that that was a very good way to look at the world of, of humanity, of people, like everyone matters. Everyone has uh, a role and impact, no matter how small or how big. And when you're on a team, you realize that very quickly, right? You know, the pinch hitter, I mean, how many pinch hitters have won key games in the postseason in baseball? A whole lot. <laughs> Guys off the bench, the 25th guy, 26th guy. And yeah, the stars uh, do their thing, but you know, you need everyone. And, and I always will remember this, like you know, a, a, a line that I always despise, right? You always hear this, the unlikely hero. Oh man, that drives yeah. me crazy. Like unlikely, yeah. that's so condescending and insulting, right? Unlikely hero. Like I'm wearing this uniform, I'm in the dugout. And just because I'm pinch hitting or whatever, or you think that I hit 220 this year, doesn't matter, right? Like unlikely hero. And uh, so everybody can be a hero at any given moment and, and have their time. So, um, you know, so I always felt like any team 
has is composed of people where you need everyone and not even, mm. even the 26 guys in baseball. Now you need the guys in triple a that are coming up. I mean, you have no idea. And uh, so it goes back to that point about, you don't know who's, who's strong until the smoke clears. Well, you don't know who the hero is until the story is written. Right. So, um, so I think that helped me with, even in the engineering world of just seeing all these parts and seeing them all as, as equally valuable. And uh, I think that's a, that's a great way to look at what we can be as a society. Mm -hmm. Thank you for explaining what systems engineering is, because I saw that on your resume and I just assume that all engineering is probably equally the same and important. And again, that's my ignorance coming out. I have no idea what it was, but you know, when you describe about having the bigger picture and seeing all the different pieces, I can see that coming out in how you approach your writing because you and you also teach a class at UConn sport and society, sport and society. Um, and and so I'm curious if you have applied that to your own personal journey in terms of, you know, because much of what this show focuses on is an athlete's athletic identity and what might come from it and the obstacles that might come from it when it is too salient and it, it kind of um, overwhelms all their other identities. But it sounds like, or it seems like you really embrace all the other pieces of you. Yeah, and because in part I I embrace all those because I don't think you can separate it. You know, like I mean, it, it's like, it, it, are you are you bringing something to baseball or is it baseball bringing something to you? Right. And, mm. and although it may be reciprocal on certain levels, like you're also bringing something, you know uh, you know, I, I might hack this analogy up, but I don't know if I, I'm going to think of it this way. Like I always think of that uh, email chain talking about uh, boiling water. Right. And they try to figure out, well, who are you? Right. So they try to determine, are you the egg are you, are you carrots or are you coffee? Right. I think, I think I got this right. Right. So the people who are carrots, you drop them in boiling water, they get soft and they disintegrate eventually. The people who are the eggs, they get so hardened by the world that they put on this shell and they try to just do everything to protect themselves. But I think you want to be coffee, right? Cause you put the coffee in and you completely change the chemistry huh. of, of the water. You be, you, it becomes coffee, right? You drop yourself in and then you become coffee and the whole environment changes. Right. So I think, and I think everybody can be those in whatever environment. Uh, but I, I always thought of that example as something where, you know, yes, baseball is major league baseball, but why won't you still believe you bring something to it? Just like you can bring something to ESPN or bring something to whatever it may be. Um, and I look, and ESPN is a, a good example because, you know, I banged the drum forever, like sport and society sport, you know, like, and look, there was all kinds of iterations over the last, whatever, 12 years of like, no, no, stick to sports or no, no, wait a minute. No, George Floyd, we have to do, you know, so <clears throat> I've always been very consistent about, the the value of sports and and its connection to informing larger society but partly because it's such a great opportunity you know it's a great opportunity to have conversations around sport and its role in society because it's a it's a it's an area where people can maybe start from a place of agreement. Hey, you're an Eagles fan. I'm an Eagles fan or whatever it is. You can kind of, you know, you're on the same team. Oh, wait a minute. We figured out how to win a championship. Although we politically disagree. Let's like talk about that. I just think that is a great opportunity to be able to share because you do have a higher goal that has to transcend all this and still happen. And it doesn't mean you have to love everybody's idea or get along in every arena, but you find a way to operate as a system because the system mm -hmm. is, is, the most important thing, so to speak. And so I also think of sport as a house of equity, right? You, you don't have a sport if you don't have rules that are upheld fairly and across the board equally, right? They have to be sort of facially neutral. So it's not like when you're playing tennis, like, oh, you play with the doubles court and I play on the singles court. Like, no, no, we have to both be following the same system, the same rules. And when you have an environment that reinforces that over and over again, and when people just like lose their mind because people cheated, oh my gosh, sign stealing or, or PEDs, or, you know, I can't believe that, you know, they deflated the football, whatever, like people are outraged when it's not fair. Right. Well, that's a great example for the rest of the world. Like, yeah, it's so important that we're all living in the same, whatever America, same rule, same constitution, same. It's so important to us that we make sure we uphold this and we make sure that we reinforce it 
so that everybody is, is our beneficiaries. Everyone mm-hmm. gets to benefit from it. So I, I always see sport. I think it's, it's, it's a tragedy when you just stick to sport. Like um, mm-hmm. I think it's like you have all these lost opportunities. All these athletes have great stories to tell of like playing in the Olympics and sitting across from the Iranian soccer team and actually having a conversation. Like, I don't know. That seems to be a great example of, of like how you get to meet, you know, your, your fellow humans out the world and, and engage on things. So, uh, and, and how do you change things if you're not talking, if you're not engaging, uh, if you don't do that, you're just in your own silo and all you're hearing is your own echoes. So where did this mindset come from? At, at what point in your life did you realize that you needed to go beyond sport and you saw sport as, as a vessel or a vehicle to talk about and address all these other issues? I mean, always, always, you know, my, because of my hometown, I can think of so many examples just in high school, let alone on the way. Like, for example, um, I remember playing in, uh, for Teaneck high school and we were playing in a town and it wasn't, it wasn't unusual. The team towns didn't love us that much because we were this kaleidoscope of color. And there were some towns that weren't exactly fans and we had pennies thrown at us and whatever. So we've been through some stuff. So at one game, uh, there was sort of a, uh, call on the field that a player got picked off on a illegal hidden ball trick, whatever the umpire blew the call. Our player was really upset and a fan started chiming in, like saying all this stuff. It started to escalate. He said something back to the fan and actually it was the wife of the guy. Cause she was chirping and he felt it wasn't a good idea for him to chime in, but he did. And he said something to her uh, because it was clearly going off the rails and clearly getting personal and clearly bordering on racial. And he just said something to squash it. Well, when we left the game, we had to go up those, you know, those big cement football steps right up the stairs mm-hmm. to get, and the bus was parked on top at the top. So we get up there and this, this like mob of kind of business casual kind of middle-aged, not, not even middle-aged, probably looking back, probably 30 something white guys, they were waiting for us at the top of the top of the stairs. And one of them kicks our captain in the chest, like the guys, 16 years old. And this, these grown men are just like beating up on high school kids. So fortunately our coach, you know, and the racial, by the way, started flowing at that point, all the N words and whatever. So the coach by the, the grace of God, basically somehow got us onto the bus and convinced us not to like fight back because he just, you know, we knew we would have been losers in this, right? High school kids, a lot of black and brown in there. And these guys would have made up whatever story they would have made up. And then we would have been the ones, even though like they're grown men beating up on teenagers. Right. So, so that was, you know, but so, so the moment though, of getting on the bus and dissecting all this and digesting all this, was like, yeah, I could look and say, oh, these white guys, and I could have just colorized it and said, well, that's that's like white society. But then I look at my teammates and I watch this diverse group of people say, no, that was wrong with what those guys did. No, like white, black, it didn't matter. Like all of us came together around like a higher value of uh, for each other and didn't let them decide like, okay, that's what we think of black and white relations. It has to be this. So we rejected that. And I think, and so then I saw sport once again was the opportunity. Here's all these kids playing baseball. They're Chinese, they're Japanese, they're Iraqi. They're, we're all one team. And we go through this racial incident and we come out of it stronger, actually. We actually, we denied that it's power. We denied it's power. So, so yeah, from, from day one, all along the way. And whether, you know, I played for Team USA for New Jersey, and the state all-star team played. So we hosted Japanese players and it was really cool. And I remember like, you know, of course we want to beat the Japanese team, we're team USA, but there was a teammate of mine who I guess didn't have a lot of exposure to black people or whatever. So he's this blonde guy and he says, um, but I just have to ask you a question. I just want to ask you a new straight face, totally honest. He says, what is it about your people that make you so incredibly lazy? Like, what is it about your people? So I was like, Okay. So, so now I'm like 16 ish. I'm like, all right. Now I know that the Japanese teams in the other dugout and I want to beat them as an American, right. Or whatever. Cause it's, it's a competition. Although I learned a lot from my Japanese roommate that week. And of course it's an exchange. It's love. They're human humanity, but I know we're competing here, but I'm also trying to figure out the friendly fire that I'm taking here. Right. Like, like, yeah. yes, 
we're still team USA, but you're kind of making this weird. Right. And I, you know, but he was a teenager and he was, I guess it was good. He was asking the question, but I also had to wonder like, where does this belief come from? Right. But now did it help him that he had a black teammate who could actually talk to him about it? Maybe it did. Maybe it did. And although you don't want to explain your existence all the time, there's moments they're like, all right, well, we're, we're still on the team and we still can win this. And we won the tournament. And, and like, maybe that makes a difference, right? Maybe it does. And maybe, and so you see the opportunity. So all through my life, there was examples of sport uh, being so much bigger than sport. And for me, Mm. I always saw that opportunity and leaned into it in everything I've done. Uh, And even in my media work, I just, I just see the possibility. And so it's not just in the current moment, but it's because of where I came from. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing those stories. And I think, you know, your, your ability to tell your narrative and to share personal moments like that. And I think those details do, do matter because, and we can dive into your experience. And I think when you share the, that story of being a high schooler and getting into it with a bunch of grown men I mean, gosh, a, a racially charged event. Like, I, I, I mean, it answers all of my questions about about your purpose and how it's not just about baseball. It's just not about not about sport. It's being able to tackle all these really difficult, ongoing societal, racial, social justice issues that um, that we continue to see even in 2022. You know, you would think we'd be much further along. That's a whole different conversation. You would think we would be much further along, but clearly not. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's just, um, yeah, I, I, I just think it's it's so fascinating. And so, you know, when you when you retired in 2005, what was that moment like in terms of what you saw for yourself, especially for somebody maybe at that point you were or were not goal oriented, but did you have a vision for yourself about how you wanted to use and continue to be around sport? No, I, I didn't really necessarily. Um, I mean, I knew I had a very good relationship with the media in a way that was was fun. I, I talked to my teammates, of course, but I also talked to, you know, Jason Starks and, you know, I just had fun talking so I, I didn't think initially like, oh, this would be my future job, but I did, you know, believe that there was a possible way I, you know, could get interviewed, excuse me, you know, be interviewed or be in the space in some way. So that, um, that was definitely, uh, in the, in, in my mind, but I, you know, the big thing at the retirement was really my wife, like just meeting my wife and kind of thinking, okay, I could keep playing and go back to AAA and go to the Padres. And, and after I got released, cause I got so I got released by the Yankees in 2005 spring training. And, um, so it was mo- a moment of like, well, I can keep hanging on and go to AAA, but I was like, I don't want to go to AAA. It was sort of Yankees or bust. Or if someone offers me a major league job after I got released and there was only a week left in camp. So I was like, well, I don't know. And the phone rang. It was a couple of minor league jobs or front office and stuff like that. And I was like, no, but then my wife was sort of, who was already an attorney and, you know, working hard and this public defender. And, and I just felt really selfish to be like, okay, forget what you're doing and follow me in some crazy minor league life until we figure it out. I just, and she was willing to do it. She was like, Hey, if you need to end on your own terms, then you need to go to Las Vegas and AAA or Padres and do what you have to do. And I kind of was like, nah, (laughs) you know, it's been 15 years and I've done it and it's your time. You know, she's younger and she was just getting her feet wet in this, in her law world. I just felt like it just seemed ridiculous for me to just keep going just, you know, with a bad hamstring and just to try to like, Oh, hang on. So that was really what became, you know, as as you know, I'm a big Hall and Oates fan and Daryl Hall, one of the lines I always remember, he wrote the song, Sarah smile and Sarah Allen is his like muse love of his life kind of thing. And the line he gave is like, when I met Sarah Allen, there really was no choice. Like that's, I always thought like that was such a good description of it. Right. So my wife was sort of like that, that's just it. That's what you do. You know, you just don't need to know anything else kind of. And so, um, yeah, so baseball kind of ended and uh, I meandered in 
real estate and, you know, all these things that I call moderately disastrous. I tried stuff, but in the end, <laughs> moderately disastrous. <laughs> Why do you describe it right. like that? Well, you know, I find it hard to believe that anything that you would do would be disastrous. <laughs> yeah. So well, we built, we, you know, it was like, um, yeah, the market crashed in real estate in like 08 oh. and I was kind of in the middle of all that. Yeah. So, um, you know, so we, we, you know, did all kinds of things, but ultimately the moment that put me in the media world was the, the Mitchell report broken baseball about all the steroids. And I was just uniquely situated to comment on it. And I remember I wasn't sure I was going to say anything, but I read a lot of the commentary and a lot of it was name calling like, Oh, these guys are bad. They're cheaters. Or, Oh, I want the list of names, name, naming, you know, it was all that. And I was like, they're, they're, we're kind of missing a whole point of view here. And, and so I said, let me just try to write something. I wrote this long kind of rambling piece and ESPN.com ran it and it, it did really well. And then my friend Alan Swartz at the New York Times said, hey, you need to write a piece for the Times. They would really love this. So I think a suggestion is you should focus on the fear, focus on how there's a reason players take steroids and it's not just greed and money. There is a, a there's an insecurity is sort of like that's So I kind of outlined it and then wrote it and you know, it did really well. And it did really well at, at the New York times, like all the people who were editors really enjoyed it. So I remember going to, uh, I got invited to a church service in Chicago by, um, by a friend and in the, in the pews sitting in our group, I guess she heard my name, you know, she, she knew the group, but I didn't know her directly. She heard my name. It's like, Oh wait, you're Doug Lambo. It's like, I read your piece in the time. It was the quint. She said, she said it was a quintessential opinion piece. And because it had all the elements of a quintessential opinion piece. And I said, well, well what are those elements? <laughs> I had no <laughs> right. So I had, <laughs> right, like me. But turned out she was a professor of journalism at in at Northwestern. Oh. So um, but that that just it, it was the example of like, no, I didn't have a plan here. I didn't have a goal, but I felt very driven and you know, magnetically so to comment on this in a different way. And that, that broke the ice. Once I had that and I got the feedback and I got, you know, book deals and things started rolling and I wasn't even at ESPN for, for that whole first year of writing, but eventually ESPN even called and said, Hey, we see you're out there doing all these things. Mm -hmm. So, so it really wasn't, I mean, in some ways it was very spoiled trajectory. I didn't think about it. And like the door was just, people were knocking on the door and I started feeling like, well, maybe I should answer this. It could be some really cool opportunities. And I think what I wanted to do was, although I love the written word and by far my favorite expression, I wanted to learn how to do it in other ways. Like you said, mm -hmm. spoken on air, TV, whatever, radio. I thought it would be really important to supplement it and create it, amplify it even more. So I started yeah. to really look at ESPN as a way to do that. But, you know, even though things happen uh, maybe seamlessly or naturally, but the one thing that you do, and it's not just poetic, but you also take some risks. You take a lot of risks because, and you, and you see situations and circumstances in a completely different light. And it takes, uh, it takes gumption and it takes courage to be able to put yourself out there and to say something differently. You know, and, um, you know, I think that when I read a lot of your pieces, that's, that's exactly what you do. And I, you know, some of the events that I hear throughout your life, um, you know, even though you mentioned that your brother was your coach and you kind of followed him, but I know there was a point around 15 years old and correct me if I'm wrong, where you decided to join a different league because you didn't want to maybe play alongside your brother. And, and so you, you decided to veer off and, and do something different. And even when you were, being drafted, you were a first round draft pick out of Penn. And there were a lot of scouts that were questioning your commitment to baseball because of your academic ambitions and, and talent there. And so it seems like you have also this thread of like, you recognize that it's okay to be different. And I'm, I'm not going to shy away from that. Yeah, no, that's, that's completely fair. And, and part of it, part of it was TNAC, I'd say, because Although we had a community, we we did feel like we were a little bit isolated as a, as a nation, you know, relative to the nation. Right, you're in a very diverse town that's fighting for these things. Uh, well before they, you know, diversity and inclusion like initiatives and things, they were just like, hey, let's. I think that was a way to know that it's okay to be 
maybe unique in that way. Like, you know, I wanted that the world to be that way, but I also knew that it wasn't, especially, you know, once I graduated high school and you go out in the world, you're like, or you have this incident in the, in the stands, you're like, wait a minute, there's a whole another world, even across the street from where I live. Right. So, so I think that made me a little more comfortable and okay. Yeah. I, I could have a different point of view, but I felt, I felt a sense of justice behind it. Like I, I felt it was a good thing. Um, and so I felt very strongly about fighting for that. And so, yeah, where I take these risks and where I take a lot of it is about, okay, I, I, all right, let me, as my mom would say, I'd look around the room, see if that anybody says anything, nobody say anything. Okay. I guess I got to say something. Right? <laughs> right. So, so it's like, you know, and so I, I kind of feel like I don't necessarily put that in the automatic like mode of like, I got to always chime in on justice. I just kind of find, I always look for the perfect storm on it of like a personal experience that I've been through that allows me to weave in things that I care about or, or, or sports in particular and have a vision for where we can go with this, right? That you're not just leave it like, Oh, I just called you out and have like no solutions or no hope or no anything. Right. Um, so I think that's where, and and by the way, I guess I, I don't see it as so risky. I mean, there's a risk in like, I feel so compelled. It doesn't matter. I guess that's what I would best say. Like, okay. Yeah, it's true. Like going and calling out the West Hartford police, not necessarily, <laughs> not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Right. Could go badly. Right. I mean, true. And, and, uh, you know, I knew that a lot of stuff was going to come my way at certain points and it did. But I, the other thing that I inherited from my dad was a lot of patience. And so you want to, if, if someone, some reason wants to come at me with whatever you, you gotta, you, you gotta have to play the long game. And, uh, cause I'll wait, mm-hmm. I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. And look, if I, you know, we take the snow shoveling incident and in, in between, in my driveway in Hartford. Right. So I don't know if, you know, your audience has reads, has time to read, but in we the Atlantic, share. But, share for um, those that don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I think the, the short version was I was shoveling my driveway after many snow days, trying to get my minivan out of the driveway because my kids were in the house for all those days. And you know how it is prim. I was like, all right, y'all got to get out of here. So I'm like, I'm going to get this <laughs> minivan out of the driveway, whatever it takes. So it's like three o'clock, you know, it's sunny out. It's, it's a zero degree day. And I'm shoveling my driveway in Hartford, Connecticut, just minding my business, just shoveling my driveway. I had my coat on. And uh, I look across the street and I see a cruiser that says West Hartford Police. And, you know, and I later I doubted myself because it seemed so surreal. But I was like, oh, that's kind of unusual. And when you grow up in New Jersey and these, the New England, you're very provincial, you know, because every town has its own board of ed and own police department, you know. So it's like, it's like notable when a police officer from another town is not in their town and they're parked in your neighborhood. You're like, what's going on? So I remember kind of keeping an eye on it as I'm shoveling. And I look up at one point minutes later and the, the, He's walking across the street, police officer. And I remember he's wearing that kind of ski mask thing. I mean, you could see his face, but that's all you could see. And really young, not a lot of facial hair. I was like, God, this guy's in his 20s. So crosses the street. And I'm kind of standing up at this point, like almost thinking like maybe he's going to ask for directions. I have no, you know, really didn't know. And very kind of snarkily just says, so, you know, trying to make an extra, you know, trying to make a few extra bucks shoveling people's driveway around here i was like whoa like that was not you know i was just like i'm in my own driveway (laughs) like it just was like and then i'm like this is bad like he's not from hartford he doesn't know hartford he's west hartford police Mm -hmm. he's you know he's kind of up mad he's kind of you know confrontational i didn't know what was going on so i kind of tried to be like small talk and eventually he kind of accepted sort of what i said but he's like happy shoveling or whatever and kind of took off. I was like, what was that? So my wife, you know, who's an attorney by trade, we sent an email to the state rep and it just snowballed from there. Uh, Now, what I learned from this is that, I mean, it was really hard, really hard to not 
like just lose it over this whole thing. Like you're in your driveway. You can imagine what, you know, it felt like I was actually robbed. Like that's what it felt like. Like someone actually stole my house. Um, and this is law enforcement, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I had to, you know, but where the sort of privilege set in is I knew a lot of people. I made a lot of calls. And within days I was sitting in West Hartford police's precinct and talking to the deputy chief and, and, uh, you know, all this stuff with my wife and a neighbor. So it turned into a really long game of advocacy work, but also trying to gain understanding. And there was a period where, you know, I eventually did a lot of research got and wrote an article for the Atlantic to describe this experience. I thought it was fair, but very honest and also descriptive. And the Atlantic editor, she was amazing. She's like, just try to try to take all the emotion out of it and just like lay it out. You know, hey, it was a snowy day. It was three o'clock and the sun was shining and reflecting to the point where you're blind by the snow. And then I finally wanted to do my duty that my wife was getting on me every week. Like, will you get out there and beat our neighbor to snow the shovel the driveway? Because he's 70 years old and it's ridiculous that he's beating you. So I went out and said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get out there. And finally the snow stopped and here is my opportunity. Like, that's what I wrote. I just laid it out. And, um, and so once I posted this article and I, and actually, you know, violation of journalism 101, I sent a draft because I had some engagement with West Hartford at this point. And I sent the draft and said, look, I want you to, let me know that this is all true. Like, I don't want you to later say like, you're making stuff up. Like, if you want to fact check this, go right ahead. And I remember the city manager said, no, nope, that's what happened. And we had already met by then, but um, it turned wow. into a long two year um, uh, community engagement experience where, uh, and I was really determined to make sure that, what I believe justice was served. And it wasn't about like punishing an officer. It wasn't even, you know, because once again, I could tap my experience and my very positive experience with law enforcement in my hometown. Let, not, alone, not only were a lot of my teammates later became officers, or the chief of police, uh, but they looked after my mom and my dad, particularly when I was playing all over the country in Major League Baseball. They drove and checked on my mom and my dad passed away, obviously. I remember at one point, the police department intercepted a call when my dad was in an ambulance to find out they were missing a specific thing they needed. And they actually picked it up and brought it to the ambulance. I mean, these are, they were, they were looked out. And when my dad had the funeral during the funeral procession, they gave a police escort, all the police and my friends mm -hmm. teammates showed up at the funeral in uniform and gave a police escort to the burial. Um, you know, so I, I think of these things and I say, once again, there's always a counterexample, right? So, uh, and a very positive one. So I, I, I said, okay, I, the reason that I could be outraged about what happened to me in my driveway isn't just because I want to be against the police, but it's because I've seen the police be my friends and be my teammates and my coaches. And I've seen, I know there's a better relationship here. So I'm demanding that this is the standard that that was the motivation. And sure, there's edification. There's all these things that's but it really is just about like, you can be better. You can be better. Mm -hmm. And and we can all learn from us trying to be better. So article and ultimately it led to the state rep was a neighbor and he set up, he proposed a law. He floated a, a bill out there and it, it ultimately passed. And I, I went through the, I'm just a bill schoolhouse rock. I mean, I went to committee meetings and hearings, testified. Mm -hmm and lobbied and met with senators and sat and said, okay. And I learned exactly how laws are made in the state of Connecticut. And I, and I pushed and I eventually the governor got it on his desk and I knew the communications director. I said, Hey, you know, here we are. It passed the Senate by consent unanimously. Here's your chance. Um, and, and I learned that there's no elegant, perfect solution outcome. First of all, when you deal with people's emotions and, you know, it's, it's already going to be imperfect anyway, just out mm -hmm. of being human. And that's okay. I think the main thing I kind of gained from that is the most important experiences was all the work to get to that law being passed because it was all, it was engagement. It was education. It was exchanging. And I, I saw an opportunity instead of me like pointing down at people and yelling at I was like, okay, we, you know, first thing I said to the police when I met 
West Hartford Police was, you have an opportunity here because I see myself as an ally in this. And although I'm offended and all these things, and I'm here to learn more what happened and all these things, there's no reason why police can't lead larger society on how to manage our bias. Because it's not just in law enforcement, it's in banking, it's in housing. And if anyone should be the most skilled at it, it's you, because you have life and death at stake. So your training about bias is really critical. And you have so much more at stake so that you can actually teach us as a society. So that was how I started the conversation. I said, bias is human, right? I was, um, and so, so we talked through that. And, And so, yes, learning and talking along the way. And I think as a result of maybe in the beginning, a lot of people didn't necessarily support me, but by the end, it was so different. And it wasn't just about me, but at that point, which is important, it was just about learning and understanding and understanding, like, even if something wasn't quote illegal, you can still see the the offense and the issues that the racial undertones, all these things that come with it. Mm. So I think, you know, that whole experience was driven by my relationship with sports and understanding team and understanding having teammates that were police officers. It was driven by growing up at Teaneck and seeing the silver lining and seeing the, the standard. It was driven by being a systems engineer and seeing that wait a minute, there's a, there's a world I can build here. It's, it was driven by my wife being a lawyer and a civil rights uh, activist and understanding the layers to the, the legality and how police and communities can work together. I mean, I had so much support and information that I felt the responsible thing to do was to try to figure out how we can all be beneficiaries instead of like, let me just sue you and just be, you know, get my paycheck and roll out or whatever. It was so much bigger than that. And so all those experiences and then being able to communicate through the pen, that was what allowed it to become the outcome it was, that was that that was spiraled into something larger. Um, you know, to this day, Los Angeles Airport, you can't discriminate by law already on the Unruh Civil Rights Act, but the LAX has a policy in place now with zero tolerance because I had this crazy experience happen at LAX and I did the mm. same thing. I wrote an article and city council and all these, and you know, they, they were outraged and they changed it, you know? And so, so yeah, some, so some dude flying in from Turkey right now, who's brown skin, who tries to get a cab, if they dare try to pass him up, a whole lot of things come down on that, that cab driver. And, and that was just from, you know, five months of my life, just sort of trying to understand it. So, you know, so there's, there's always an opportunity. And and so sports, I've only had reinforcing examples of how Mm -hmm. sports can change the world. And so I figured why not? (laughs) Man. I mean, I think if there's anybody that I've talked to, that has offered a blueprint for how to engage in productive dialogue and how to productively in a positive manner engage and work through conflict, especially through some really historically charged issues that center around racial issues. It is, it is you. And again, like that, you talk about the silver lining and the aspirational nature. I mean, those are just a couple, un, again, another couple of examples um, of how that comes out in the work that you do that extends beyond baseball. And so, you know, I think one of my final questions is the, an interview that we just, we just aired with former NFL wide receiver, Walter Powell Jr. Uh, he shared his story about you know, being a journeyman in the NFL and the moment when he realized and verbalized the idea that football is my passion, but it is not my purpose in life. And so your North Star, how would you define your North Star? Because it's clearly something, baseball is part of your journey, but it is not all of it. So how would you define that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm I'm driven, I'm motivated really by collective humanity. You know, like I just, you know, if there's a weight in any of this, it's it's probably just going back to Teaneck, New Jersey, and thinking about how beautiful it was that people mm-hmm. of different backgrounds got along swimmingly, beautifully. And it wasn't because there was no conflict. It was just that people 
could get past a lot of things and and figure, see each other in each other, right? You, you just saw it was so much more important that we shared an experience than it was like, oh, you're darker, you're lighter, you know, you know. I went to as many bat mitzvahs as I went to confirmations as I went to, you know. I just and and I think there and the open mindedness of it to be able to to grow from it. I mean, that's how I grew up, and I think that that north star is elevating humanity in a way that we are able to come together and and really, you know see ourselves in each other. And, and so, yes, of course we come from different walks of life. And my dad was from Trinidad. My mom grew up in Jim Crow South. And of course I'm shaped by those things as well. But I think those things help me see certain things that I can identify that, that is like maybe away from this hope that we are coming together. Like those, these dividers. Um, I think I, I see the world, you know, if you, if you support, not just like, it's easy to say, well, as a black man, I'm going to just fight for these black issues or whatever, as opposed to being like, wait a minute, like my journey is aligned with women. My journey is aligned with Muslims. My journey is aligned with all, you know, cause we're all kind of looking for the same thing, respect, you know, just being able to be included and trying to be fair and trying to, you know, we're all like parents and we're all trying for most you know the same things, you know, it's like fundamentally. So uh, I don't think it's complicated to be like, well, how can we all give it to each other, right? Like, and we're we're certainly bigger and stronger and more effective as a as a unit, as a team, than we are as like individuals or in our silos, right? Who just want power or all these things. Um, mm-hmm. And I and I recognize that power is a big part of it. Like, you know, you it, it it tends to try to reinforce itself and to preserve itself and who the holder is, and and I think that's a hard thing. But um, but when you reduce people to these these simplified boxes all the time because it's you know politically it could could be convenient or power wise it allows you to tell the story of like why i need to be in charge and you not or whatever uh i think you're just missing so much about what we could be as as uh, as with humanity like how we can actually live um it's ambitious sure but i think you you know speaking to that point about yeah i i do I step out there on these things. Right. And, and like, yeah, I wrote about steroids. I wrote about, you know, Jim Cott, a colleague of mine, you know, just to talk about, but it's not like, I try not to do that. Like, Oh, let me Jim, you're, you're a bad guy. You know, it's like, Hey, you know what? Look, you know, we're all in this together. <laughs> like, And I just want to like present some understanding from my experience that might help create better understanding about what, what the issue was, even if that wasn't the intent, right. And how that ripple, like, that's important. And, and like you said, the constructive dialogue, like working with the police, like I sit on the Connecticut police council now after that experience. <laughs> and, wow. and so five years now we've been unbelievably productive and, and we're, in, you know, it's like civilians and police chiefs and we're all, and we set all the policy. We have a police accountability bill. We've, we've passed all kinds of legislation we've helped pass been, you know, deeply involved. And, and so I also like to back it up, like, okay, you know, I, you know, I know it's easy to just be like, Oh, police. And it's like, no, I'm actually in the room. Right? <laughs> I'm actually yeah. like working on this stuff and it's slow and it's hard sometimes. And, but, um, but we, we get a lot of things done about it with training and they say, okay, you need better training. Well, that's what we do. So I, um, you know, I think that that there's, um, there's so much possibility. And so that North star for me is, is really like seeing people included, whatever walk of life, all coming together. It's almost like, yeah, my, my North star is that we're all on the same baseball team, you know, and Mm. we're all striving um, to win a championship together and no matter what sink or swim, we're going to do it together and, um, and come away with that, that experience of, of, what it can be to be in harmony with, with people uh, and realize that all those things that are actually really important transcend, you know, the boxes that we, that are created or we put ourselves in um, that are not really descriptive of our identity. It's just, it's a shortcut. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, when I wrote this article about take, why I didn't take a, uh, why I wouldn't want to be interviewed as a manager right now. And it was, uh, it was concerned about a lot of things. It's like, no, it's not, not the right time for me. I said, you know, we spend so much time figuring out the box we're trying to put people in that the real most important thing is helping people understand what it is to live in that box. Right. It's like, yeah. like, what does it, mm. what does it do when you're, you're put in it or you're, 
you know, and that's not to say you don't have, I, I'm Trinidadian, Southern African American, you know, my kids are like Cape Verdean, whatever, you know, all these things. Yeah, sure. That's, that's important. Um, but I think, it, you know, I think it's, it's just weaponized so much in, yeah. in ways that could be so negative. So I want to be on the same team. I want us all to be on the same team. And that, that is my North star. I gotta say, I've never loved baseball so much after this conversation because the the interwoven life lessons and the reflection and the parallels is is absolutely awesome. And I think for me, selfishly and per, you know, I think that's the that's why I love doing these interviews so much because I oftentimes hear these stories and I reflect on my own self as a you know as a budding psychologist and hopefully as somebody as an you know, activist, somebody who hopes to leave a lasting impact like you're doing right now. And I love the aspirational tone and everything that you're talking about. I'm definitely walking away and I'm like, dude, I need to work on my long game and become <laughs> way more patient because, you know, on a day where Brittany Griner is sentenced to nine years in prison over in Russia and just all this other stuff, my own personal issues and trying to work through the system and all this other stuff, but the long game the patience, the compassion, the product, productive dialogue, the opportunistic mindset. Professor Glanville, I'm walking away with a lot of those lessons. And I'm sure that a lot of your students are no question walking away with so many, so many things. Um, but thank you so much for coming on and sharing, sharing your stories and being so vulnerable and, and all, also offering all these intimate details about your upbringing and, and the relationship with your parents. And now the fluidity and the the poetry that comes out in your work, I now know, know and understand where it comes from. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, Prim, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure and uh, look forward to talking more in the future, definitely. Really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Doug. I appreciate all of you listening. As always, if you have any thoughts, comments, or questions about the next chapter, feel free to hit me up at prim underscore seripipat at any one of my social media platforms, including Instagram and Twitter. The next chapter with Prim Seripipad is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.